Masters University, this is such a great and immense privilege because I spent so much time on this campus many, many years ago. We raised our kids here in uh, Santa Clarita, and our kids used to be in that corner playing basketball during the basketball games. And uh, I was always trying to be careful because they were a little wild over there, and the ball that they were playing with would come out on the court and uh, right during the game, and so the official would blow the whistle, and I would point fingers at the other parents' kids, and you know, it wasn't ever my kids, that kind of thing. And, uh, but we rode bikes around this campus. I spent time uh, overseeing the admissions department many years ago, and it's very nostalgic to be here today. I want to look at just two passages. I appreciated Hannah's testimony. Uh, First Peter is about suffering. We're going to look at the opening verse of Second Peter as an introductory passage. And then I want to go to an experience Peter had in the Gospel of John, where we'll spend most of our time. So take a look with me at 2 Peter chapter 1. I notice when people build some social media page or whatever, they put on their descriptors of themselves, the things that they want people to know as the identifiers of their life, who they are. I notice they put all kinds of things. I am a lover of the five solas, or I have these amazing kids, or husband to Wonder Woman, or how, whatever goes on in their profile that they list on social media. W- one person put on there, I'm a thought leader, and I thought, oh, that's interesting, a thought leader. What would they say to you? Hey, I want to lead your thoughts. Um, okay, that's interesting. Go ahead, lead my thoughts. I <laughs> mean, just strange titles. Another one was Master Creative, and when I read it, I thought, that's Masterfully creative. Anyway, really interesting identifiers. Sometimes people put blogger. I saw a guy had pastor blogger, and then the next week, blogger pastor, and it made me wonder what changed. Peter is completely consumed with one single identifier in 2 Peter. Notice how he opens this passage. Simon Peter, a slave of Jesus Christ. Of course, he mentions to them that he's been called to be an apostle. We'll talk about that in a moment. But this is his identifier, a slave of Jesus Christ. If it came to describing himself, the only way he could possibly describe himself, this was it. For Peter, this said everything about him. I'm a slave of the Lord Jesus Christ. Most of your modern translations will say bondservant, as you know, or servant, but this word is a very tight word. It's always been very tight in the original language. It means slave. It's used 124 times in the New Testament that way. Slave, always slave. Using that designation then, Peter is loading his identity with all that this description would have meant to the culture at that time. And of course, as you know, what comes to our minds when we think of the term slaves, all the wicked ways that slave trades through the years across cultures have, have really trampled human dignity and trampled human beings with violence and cruelty, trading them for money, and all of those evils come to our mind. But the New Testament writers called themselves by that term, and the reason they did that is because while it is true that that term conjures up in our minds the abuse of humanity, it is for the New Testament believer ownership. I am owned by the master of my soul. I'm owned by the one whose yoke is easy and whose burden is light. I'm owned by the King of kings and the Lord of lords. That's the highest privilege of all. As Paul would tell the Corinthians, you're bought with a price. You're not your own. To be owned by the master who bought Peter with his own precious blood, that descriptor became most precious to him. It wasn't just Peter who loved it. All throughout church history, from John's apostle Polycarp, who said the same thing, bind up your loose robes and serve as God's slaves in reverential fear and truth, all the way to the next three or four centuries, Christians named themselves Slaves of Christ, by the time you get to Augustine, he said, look, does your Lord not deserve to have you as 
his trustworthy slave. And it's the Lord Jesus himself who set the precedent, Luke 17, 10. When you've done all that I've commanded, consider yourself as unworthy slaves who've only done what's expected of you. I love that. How did Peter come to these convictions? Well, he had an encounter, a final encounter with Jesus after Jesus rose from the dead. Take a look at John 21 for a moment. And we'll spend the rest of our time here in John 21, a very familiar story, but it is remarkable as we are challenged to be an influence. We're challenged to do what God has commissioned us to do the way Peter is challenged here. And there are some features about this challenge that are are profound for us, that motivate us. I love the fact that Brooks on Monday talked about being a soldier Of course, a soldier is enlisted into service by Christ. And as Paul told Timothy in 2 Timothy 2, I I want to please the one who enlisted me as a soldier. That is true. That is dead on. And here, what we find here is Peter having it put into his heart certain features that motivate him to be what he later calls himself, a slave of Christ. You own me. You, You do whatever you want with my life. I don't have my own agenda. I'm going to continue to get rid of my own comforts and my own agenda. You do with me as you choose. You purchased me. I want to look at this account and watch what Jesus does with this precious brother in the Lord. You know the story. They went back to fishing. A strange thing. Peter goes back to fishing after the resurrection And, of course, as they were fishing, and they're not actually catching anything, even though he is a seasoned man of the trade, verse 4 of chapter 21, as day was breaking, Jesus stood on the shore. The disciples didn't know it was Jesus. And he says to them, children, (laughs) very interesting. It sounds condescending to us, but basically he was saying, um, uh, dependent ones, needy ones, do you have any fish? Of course, they hadn't caught any fish, and he says to them what no seasoned fisherman wants to hear from some upstart on the shore, cast the net on the right side of the boat, and you'll find some. And so they did it, and now they were not able to haul it in because of the quantity of the fish. I love how the gospel writers, including John here, just walk right past that. We typically, when we think of such a miraculous the defiance of the natural laws, the suspension of natural laws, the control of fish in the Sea of Galilee. We would write about that and embellish it. They just, he just walks right through it, casts it on the other side, and they're not able to haul it in because of the quantity of fish. And then John, identifying himself as the disciple whom Jesus loved, he mentions it here in verse 7, and he said to Peter, it's the Lord. And when Simon Peter heard it was the Lord, he put on his outer garment, for he was stripped for the work, and he threw himself into the sea. And the other disciples came in the boat, dragging the net full of fish. They weren't far from the land, about 100 yards off. When they got out on the land, they saw a charcoal fire in place with fish laid out on it and bread. Jesus has made them breakfast. And he says, bring some of the fish that you've just caught. So Simon went aboard and hauled the net ashore full of large fish, 153 of them. And although there were so many, the net wasn't torn. Jesus wanted them bringing them in. It was the haul he wanted to demonstrate that he was with them, providing for them. So Jesus says, come and have breakfast, verse 12. The disciples didn't dare ask him, who are you? Because they knew it was the Lord. I mean, why does John put that little mention in there? Well, it's because they'd asked him so often. They should have known already a long time ago. They had believed it, but they got fickle. And they were always asking him, well, I mean, who, where are we going? Why are we going to Jerusalem? Peter, most of all, pushing back on who Christ was through much of his work with Jesus on the earth. And here, John just wants to mention, we got it at least so far as this encounter goes. We knew it was the Lord. So Jesus comes and takes the bread and he gives it to them and with the fish. 
This is the third time Jesus was revealed to the disciples after he was raised from the dead. And when they'd finished breakfast, Jesus isn't done. He needs to speak to this disciple. This disciple who went back to fishing. He'd blown it. He'd blown it big time. This is, he knows he is not useful in his own mind. He's thought it through. I, I'm not going to be useful. God isn't going to do anything with me. All the stuff that we did for three years, nearly three years, it's over for me. I love what Jesus does here. The first thing he does, if you're writing down some outline, is he speaks about the first love of spiritual influence. The first love of our witness. If you're going to be a witness, there has to be some driving force behind it. And Jesus goes at Peter in this very dramatic way. You know it well. Notice what he says. Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? And he said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said it again. Verse 16, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And he said, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He says it again in verse 17, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter is grieved because he asked him a third time, do you love me? Now, when Jesus is publicly reaffirming Peter and commissioning him to give his life as an ambassador to the gospel, the first thing the Lord does is drive home this truth that Peter's call to the work is a call that is driven by your love for the Savior. Sometimes I'll just ask someone who professes Christ, do you love Jesus Christ? And then when they say, yes, I love Jesus Christ, I will say, if I spent an hour with you, would I know it? Would I know it? Jesus is saying to Peter, I want you to love me enough to listen to what I'm about to tell you. He's calling him to his first love before he does anything else. You leave behind every other competing affection, and I'm pointing your entire life Godward in the labors that I call you to in your ministry. Notice the haunting repetition. Do you love me more than these? Do you love me? Do you love me? It's an interesting little add-on there. Do you love me more than these? Sometimes people get confused with that. More than, more than what? More than, more than these other, you know, disciples' works? Well, I think it is true contextually that it seems that he's referring to the way Peter boasted all the time that I'm, I, I actually serve you, Lord, more than these other disciples. You remember Matthew 26? Though all of these disciples fall away, I will never fall away. Maybe Jesus is asking him, do you love me more than, than the ones that you say you, uh, you are stronger than and you'll go further than with the gospel? You'll take it further than they will? Do you love me more than those like you boast that you do? John 13, 37, Lord, why can I not follow you right now? I'll lay down my life for you. Peter was, and he said it a lot. He said it strongly, forcefully. And so Jesus is asking Peter if he'd been spending his time proving his boast. Does Peter's love for the Lord reflect a depth that matches these daring moments where he says, I, I, I love you, I'll serve you? Does his loyalty to Christ prove what he so often boasted about? It's a huge question. All the disciples, this had to happen in front of the disciples. All of them knew that Peter had boasted of being faithful, and yet they all knew uh, that though he drew the sword in the garden and Jesus had put the sword away, Peter was aggressive. They knew that. They knew he had followed Jesus and his captors to the courtyard, but they also knew that he had a meltdown in the courtyard. Bitter cowardice, cursing with vulgarities that he didn't know Christ. Peter, do you love me more than these like you've claimed so many times? And then sometimes people read this passage, and if they know anything about the original language, it is true, Jesus uses different terms for love, but I don't, I don't know that he's doing anything other than synonyms. 
He's just piling up synonyms. Peter, do you love me? Peter, do you have the highest affection for me? Peter, do you deeply care for me? He's just using different words to speak of the depth and range of love that would prove itself in an entrenched friendship, a service, a sacrifice. Do you love me in all the ways that someone would prove it? If you're driven by anything horizontal or earthly, then your service to Christ isn't going to be what he wants it to be. So Jesus was asking Peter why he'd be serving. Peter, I, I'm your preeminent love and affection. And so I need to be the reason you serve my people because what I'm going to call you to is going to be very challenging. The first love of our spiritual influence. And by the way, it starts there because nothing will matter when you meet Christ than your spiritual influence. Nothing. Not your course study, not your career that you pursue, not the spouse you married, not the church you go to, not the things that you did in your job, not the people you met or people you knew or the trophies in your trophy case. None of that will matter. The only thing that will matter, Jesus says, before him in the judgment is your spiritual influence. That's it. All those other things are used for tools in your spiritual influence. Your pursuits that you have right now, the things that you're concentrating on and the wonderful achievements that God in his grace gives you to do and to have, all of it is a tool for spiritual influence, not for you to, at the end of it, say, well, this, is, this was all for me. No, not at all. Spiritual influence alone is all that's going to matter. And so Jesus starts there in this whole matter of first love. Notice secondly, in this encounter, the hard lessons of our influence. The hard lessons of our influence. You say, where do you see that? Well, he asked him three times. I can't be dogmatic about this, but the text doesn't say uh, specifically why Jesus asked him three times. However, he did deny Christ three times. And so Jesus is asking the question, where are your affections? Do you love me? Do you have as high an affection for me as you say? Will you serve me like you said you would? Because Peter's denials were so profoundly about each of these questions. In other words, his claim to love Christ needs to be as notorious as the denials were. Think about it. What was the first denial? I don't associate with Christ. What is Jesus saying when he says, do you love me the first time? Will you associate with me? What was the second denial? I'm not his disciple. And the second time Jesus asked him, do you love me enough to say you're my disciple? Not just to associate with people who associate with me, but say that you're my follower, that you follow me. And the third denial was so brazen and filled with vulgarities. I do not know the man. I don't want you to ever think that I was part of his ministry. And so you notice here, he says, Simon, do you love me? And he said, Lord, you know that I love you. You know everything. Really? Do you love me enough to be as passionate in my defense as your passionate railing against me in the courtyard? Will you speak as vehemently about me and because you love me and to do ministry for me as you were in the courtyard when you were pointing your finger and saying, don't ever think that I had anything to do with him? Such an intimate moment right here. No matter the amount of failure Peter has had, I love this. At one point in his ministry, you know that Jesus divulged something that went on supernaturally that Peter would have never known. Jesus said to him, Satan has asked permission to sift your life, to take you down. And Jesus said, but I have prayed for you. And when you have returned, strengthen others. Satan's demanded to sift you like wheat, Peter. I don't know about you, but if if something like that was said by the Lord to me, please, 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 don't give me any ministry where I'm a target. Don't give me any usefulness where I stand out. I, I'm too afraid of that. 
But then Jesus said, but I've prayed for you. I've prayed for you, and when you have returned, strengthen others. You're, you're going to stumble. You're going to trip up. Maybe that's you. Maybe you thought, I can't, Pastor, I can't do things for the Lord because I have all of these ways that I keep in my weakness tripping over the same pattern of sin. Or like Paul says to the Thessalonians, I'm faint-hearted. I have a small soul. I don't really trust the Lord when I should. And so I've got all these areas in my life where I'm supposed to walk by faith and I won't even step out over the gap even once. How could the Lord use me? Or maybe you're saying, I, like Peter did, I'm just unruly. I'm aggressive, I'm foolish, I'm way out over the front of my skis all the time. Lord, you have constantly had to rescue me and bring me back. You, how could you use me? You know, beloved, there's a, there's a bit of that in every Christian life where you really know that we are unworthy and we can't be used were it not for the grace of God. And I can't, I can't make it without being dependent upon him. And Peter is learning the preciousness of the Lord here. And though it is hard lessons, do you love me? I'm asking you three times to remind you how often you denied me and yet... When you've returned, I want you to strengthen others. Our witness is driven by our first love, and it has hard lessons in it, and yet we're promised by the Scriptures that when He chastens us, it is that we might share in His holiness. We're not to wallow in self-pity over those things. The chief shepherd knows None of your failure is outside of his foreordaining love and knowledge of all that was going to take place when he saved you. Everything we, that goes on in our life is right on time. He'll use it all because he loves his children and he does all these things that we might share in greater Christ-likeness. That's what Peter finds out when he's hearing the echo of these denials in his heart and in his mind. That leads to a third feature here, the undeserved privilege of our influence. Not just the first love of our witness and the hard lessons of our witness and influence, but the undeserved privilege of it. Simon, do you love me? Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Then feed my lambs. Tend my sheep. Shepherd my sheep. What a privilege. And this, by the way, was very important as a public restoration of ministry. All the disciples saw what he did. All the apostles saw what he did. They, there was not going to be any credibility if the Lord Jesus was going to give the beginning of the church, the new covenant people of God, the keys to it, to Peter and say, you, you preach the first sermon on the, on the day of Pentecost in the book of Acts. You preach it. You launch it. He couldn't do that if the disciples were sitting in the background saying, yeah, right. Yeah, we know what you did in the courtyard. And so Jesus right in front of them is saying, I, ha I have not set you aside. Peter, you're not on the shelf I'm just testing your first love. I'm reminding you of the hard lessons so that you're humbled to be dependent upon me in faith. And I'm telling you, I'm giving you my sheep to influence. Listen, when I was raising my kids, four kids, I got saved at 21. My wife and I already had kids. We weren't believers when we were married. I'm raising these four kids and they're looking me in the eyes and I'm scared out of my mind. Lord, these are souls. That's right. He gave me the privilege of shepherding souls. You say, well, pastor, I don't, I'm not married. I don't have any kids. Yeah, but you have a sphere of influence. You have a sphere of influence. There are people looking at your life, watching your life, depending upon what you do, listening to how you speak about the truth, listening to whether you love Christ and prove it in the hard tests of life, listening whether you sit around in self-pity or go sit on the shelf, or whether you get back up and say, Lord, your forgiveness is rich and free, and your grace is amazing, and so I'm going to step forward, and just because I've stumbled does not mean I'm on the shelf. You have a sphere of influence. What are you doing with it? That's what Jesus is doing here with Peter. 
Peter, I'm restoring you to public ministry. I'm bestowing on you an influence, leadership influence in front of the other men. And I'm giving you a specific challenge to your frequent boasting. You say you love me. I've called you to shepherd my sheep. You get after it. What are you fishing for? What are you going back to your old job for? I know you feel secure there, but I don't want you to feel secure in yourself. I want you to feel secure in me and do what I've called you to do. That's what I want you to do. Man, the, the triple affirmation, my sheep, my lambs, my sheep. This is a call to spiritual influence. Beloved, listen, God has called you as a Christian the moment he saved you to take the sphere of influence he brings to your doorstep and influence them. Now, that ought to grip our hearts. You say, how do I do that? Then learn the tools. I mean, you're learning them. You have so many mentors in your life, so many people you could tap into, and, and many of you probably do. You, you've known what the others still need to learn. There are mentors who can hand you the tools, and those tools are essential for every season of life. And then you're learning to walk by faith. Peter needed to learn to walk by faith, not by his own impulses not by his own uh, passions and feelings. He needed to learn to step out where, the, where it would cost him the most. The things he never wanted to step into, Jesus is saying, I want you to step into that. That's real faith. When you're at the precipice and there's no bridge in view, I want you to step out where there's no bridge, trusting me that the moment your foot hits the air, it's going to hit solid ground because I put a bridge there. I'm not going to give you the guarantee of the bridge ahead of time. I'm your bridge. I'm your guarantee. Peter, step out. Do it. That is the same lesson for every person whom God has saved. You have life to impart. What are you doing with it? The undeserved privilege of our witness. How profound. But it comes with a cost. I don't know what God's got for your life. I don't know what he has for the end of my life. We have a, an amazing little view here of what Jesus tells Peter his end is going to be like, and it is this fourth feature of this work that Jesus is doing in Peter in this little encounter. He's talked about his first love, his hard lessons, his undeserved privilege, and now he's going to talk about the high cost of it. Notice what he says to him in verse 18, truly, truly, I say to you, when you were young, you used to dress yourself and walk wherever you wanted. And when you're old, you're going to stretch out your hands and another's going to dress you and carry you where you don't want to go. John writes here so that everyone would know this isn't cryptic. Peter knew. This he said to show by what kind of death he was to glorify God. Wow, a little preview of a coming attraction no one wants to know. You're going to be martyred, Peter. You used to go around, you're a man's man, you're at the shoreline of Galilee, you're the fisherman of fishermen, people follow you in your trade, I'm calling you out of that, and oh, by the way, that freedom that you have, I want you to press forward in the gospel, be an influencer, preach and teach and shepherd my sheep, and one day, all that's going to come to an end, here's how it's going to come to an end, all that freedom on earth, it's going to be taken away from you, and they're going to tie your hands and bind them and take you and incarcerate you. And John adds, it was because it would cost him his life. You know, we don't really know what happened, but when I was raising our kids, we used to read the Fox's Book of Martyrs, and then as more volumes came on to show us martyrdoms across the world, we would read that to our kids. And I remember one dad saying to me one time, why do you want to read so, so many morbid stories to your kids? Like, are you kidding? I want my kids to know the cost. They're here in America. Sure, we're paying a little more cost than we've ever paid, and maybe that's going to accelerate. It sure seems to be. It sure seems that the target is on your back in your generation, bigger than it was on mine. It seems to be accelerating. But I wanted my kids to see what church history, what covenant ministry, 
what gospel emissaries were facing from the beginning all the way till now. And those stories enriched our lives. Tradition tells us that Peter was crucified because he was the head disciple of Christ and he was to be crucified. But tradition also says, and whether it's true or not, it certainly seems like Peter, he refused to be crucified right side up like the Lord. And therefore, tradition says he was crucified upside down. But notice how Jesus finished this as a little preview of, of Peter's end. After saying this, he said to him, verse 19, follow me. That's Jesus' answer to everything. Peter, do you love me? Yes, I love you. Then feed my lambs. Follow me. Peter, one day you're going to pay the high cost and they're going to come and take your life and they're going to kill you for serving me. Uh, here's the answer. Follow me. Don't, don't hesitate. Don't flinch. Don't get into your own head and think, well, I'm not sure, Lord. I'm not really sure I, I can do that. Don't calculate the path of influence spiritually. Follow me, Jesus says. What's he commanded you to do? Be a witness. Testify. Use all these tools that you have in life, all these relationships you have in life, all this sphere of influence to make the gospel known, to magnify Christ, to demonstrate his power in your life. Do all of that. Just follow me. Sure, you make your plan, but the Lord directs your steps. And don't ever say, I'm going to go here and do this and that, James says, without saying, if the Lord wills. Because anything less, he says, is arrogance. Don't, Don't do that, Jesus says to Peter. Follow me. And he said it right on the heels of telling him how he would die. Stop being consumed, Peter, with securing yourself and the things of earth and go where I ask you to go. In whatever circumstance I call you to walk, through whatever trials and tests and hardships and refining fires that Jesus puts in our path, whatever ultimate gospel impact God determines, do it with eagerness, with zealousness for the work. Don't work for your outcome, Peter. When I've read this, each time I've read it, I I just can't help but imagine that Peter must have often thought of how utterly foolish it was for he and the other disciples to argue about who is the greatest among them. We love to secure ourselves, create our own destiny, especially men. Men love to feel powerful over others, presenting what we know, what we've achieved, who we spend time with, what's in our bank account, where we live, what we drive, where we vacation. Jesus says, I want all that over there in the useless column, you follow me. This goes back to the, the very dramatic point Jesus made before breakfast. He'd supplied everything they need. He goes before them. He controls the universe just like he does yours. Beloved, he has made provision for us. Wherever you follow Christ, the provision has been made. He's made a path, conquered the ultimate enemy, which is death. He can be trusted. One author records the account of a second century believer named Santus. Listen to this. Santus said, I am a Christian. This is second century. I'm a Christian. The young man said nothing else as he stood before the Roman governor and his life was hanging in the balance and his accusers pressed him again, hoping to trip him up or force him to recant. One more time he answered with the short phrase, I'm a Christian. It was in the middle of the second century during the emperor Marcus Aurelius, whom you've studied. Christianity was illegal. Believers throughout the Roman Empire faced the threat of death. The young man just repeatedly told them over and over again during the trial, I am a Christian. And no matter what question he was asked, he always gave the same unchanging answer. According to the historian Eusebius, 
Sanctus, Sanctus girded himself against his accusers with firmness, such firmness that he would not even tell his name or the nation or the city to which he belonged or whether he was bond or free, but he just simply answered, I'm a Christian. And when it last became obvious that they weren't going to be able to get him to do anything, they severely tortured him, and then he was put to public death in the amphitheater. And on the day of his execution, of course, he was forced to run the gauntlet and subject to wild beasts and they tied him to a chair that had burning iron and through all of it he just kept saying, I'm a Christian. That was how he identified himself. That was his first love. Those, the, the hard lessons of his life had taught him to stand firm in his convictions and they were galvanized. He considered serving Christ an undeserved privilege and the high cost was worth it. But Jesus has one more thing to say, and it has to do with the dangerous enemy of our influence, the dangerous enemy of our influence. You know what happened? Jesus said, follow me, and you know what? Peter turned and looked at the disciple whom Jesus loved who was following them. You can imagine John just listening in as Peter and Jesus are moving away and walking and talking a little bit. John is not far behind because he wants to hear this. And he mentions himself here as the one who leaned back against Christ during the supper and had said, Lord, who is it that's going to betray you? He's mentioning that it's him. Peter is hearing the words, follow me, and all he can think about is someone else. And so when he saw John, he said, Lord, what about this man? You know what the enemy of our influence is? Instead of looking at Christ, we sinfully fear that God can't take care of us and so we start making these comparisons to join a group of people to give us um, confidence. When Jesus says, follow me, he wants you to follow by faith, but we don't like that because he may ask us to go it alone, to go somewhere that no one else has gone. We do this, beloved, all the time, and it's a detriment to our faith and a detriment to your influence and a detriment to your strength and conviction. Lord, Lord, what about them? Why do I have to take this path? Why these physical trials for me? Why did I have to be born into that troubled family? Why do I have to go do this kind of thing you've called me to do and endure these kinds of things and pay this kind of cost? Why, Lord? So many other people seem to have it so simple. But I want you to walk this path, the Lord says. I've providentially laid out this path. But what what about them? Man, the Lord's answer is abrupt. If it's my will that he remain on until I come, what is that to you? Man, it can't get any more abrupt than that. What is someone else's path who follows me? What is that to you? Why are you imagining that by comparing yourself with others, by thinking it through in your own mind, by orchestrating your own secure path, taking the rocks and boulders out of your own calling, why do you think you can secure a better influence than I could give you? Peter, if I want John to remain on like Enoch and like Elijah and be taken to heaven in a chariot and never experience what you've experienced, what is that to you? You follow me. Follow me. F.F. Bruce wrote a book, he wrote two volumes on the hard sayings of Jesus, and in one of them, it's the place in the Gospels, Luke and Matthew recorded, where Jesus says, unless you hate father and mother and sister and brother, uh, you cannot be my disciple. Matthew gives the sense of it in the other way that it is quoted. Whoever loves father and mother more than me is not worthy of me, Matthew 10, 37. Whoever loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. These are hard sayings. But what Jesus is saying is your love for me and your desire to follow me by comparison with any other human love or pursuit, 
should look like the opposite. I reign in your heart. My path is mapped out for you. I will secure you. I will make you an influence. Listen, isn't it freeing that you don't have to craft or contrive your spiritual influence? Just follow Christ in this first love that you have for him. Knowing that he is taking you through your hard lessons and stumblings and sanctifying you. Giving you privilege of influence, even though we aren't going to give him other than anything other than a meager offering most of our life. It's a privilege. And ultimately, high cost is up to God. We shouldn't compare. That's a dangerous enemy of our influence because it takes us off track. Richard Baxter said, take heed to yourselves, lest your example contradict your doctrine, and you unsay with your lives what you say with your tongues. That's what Jesus wanted to say to Peter. Peter, don't unsay with your life what you say with your tongue. I love what is said about Santus, the way it ended. And all the earthly martyrs, they would reply to all questionings about them with the short but comprehensive answer, I'm a Christian. The question was repeated, who are you? And they replied, I've already said that I'm a Christian, and he who says that, and he who says that has thereby named his country and his family and his profession and all things else besides. That's right. If you say, I'm a follower of Christ, you've named my land, you've named my people, you've named my passion, you've named my country, you've named everything because that's who I am. Who do others say that you are, having spent time with you? That was the challenge to Peter. What a marvelous victory story. Peter stands up on that first day, and he just preaches boldly, and he says to the Jews, this man whom you crucified God has made him Lord and Christ. That's bold. He didn't know if that day he was going to be tied up and crucified right there or whether the Lord would give him more influence. And of course, the Lord did. And at one point, it came to the end of the line and he was taken away and he was killed. What a sweet and precious heart Peter must have had when he was crucified for the Savior. A softness in in his heart. Lord, I'm following you. You told me how I'd die. It's happening. I love following you. Thank you for giving me influence, Lord. Thank you. No wonder in 2 Peter 1, he said, Simon Peter, a slave of Jesus Christ. Would you bow with me for a moment? Lord, we have so little else to say. We aren't always faithful to follow you as we ought. But penetrate our hearts with these wonderful, straightforward principles that you gave to Peter. And make us an influence, an instrument of your peace, an instrument of your grace. And may we follow you in faith, get out of our own heads, never get distracted with earthly comparisons or consumed with things here on earth. But you've saved us. We're bought with a price. Make us slaves who honor you in a manner worthy of this great gift we've been given. And we ask it for your glory's sake, O oh Lord. Amen.